Good morning and welcome to the UCF College of Engineering and Computer Science. My name is Marwan Saman and I'm the Dean of, of the college. And our college is pleased to host the Senior Design Day with over 60 projects being exhibited in the atria between uh, Engineering 1 and Engineering 2 building, these two buildings, and the Harris Engineering Center, which is the building right uh, on this side of both of our buildings. The College Senior Design Day includes, includes both the fourth annual Senior Design Symposium on Renewable and Sustainable Energy, which is sponsored by Progress Energy, and the college-wide Senior Design Showcase. During their senior year, our engineering students bridge the gap between academic and professional experience by participating in a year-long design and build projects that involve different disciplines of, engineering, of the engineering profession. Along with their faculty advisors, our students work to develop innovative product proposals, conduct design analysis, design and build a prototype, and prepare engineering final reports. Today, the students present and demonstrate their projects to you. Senior Design Day highlight the next wave of engineering and computer science undergraduate talent in our college. Lots of hard work has been put in these projects, and I really encourage you to go around whenever you get a chance and visit with our students and ask them questions and make sure that they are able to answer your questions. They have worked very hard over the year, this past year, to complete these projects. Uh, before I introduce our keynote speaker, I'd like to express our appreciation to uh, Bob Rich, Pete Alferis, and many, many of the faculty and staff members uh, of our College of Engineering and Computer Science who have made this day possible. This is the first time that we're holding such a big senior design day that showcases all of our engineering student talent. So let's give them all a UCF warm <laughs> round of applause. <laughs> we are very, very pleased and honored today to have Dr. Dan Arvizu as our keynote speaker for this event. Dan Arvizu became the eighth director of the U.S. Department of Energy's National Renewable Energy Lab, also known as NREL on January 15, 2005. NREL, located in Golden, Colorado, is the Department of Energy's primary laboratory for energy efficiency and renewable energy research and development. NREL is operated by DOE, for DOE, by Alliance for Sustainable Energy. Dr. Avizu is president of Alliance and also is an executive vice president with the Midwest Research Institute headquartered in Kansas City, Missouri. Prior to joining NREL, Dr. Iviso was the chief technology officer with CH2M Hill Companies. Before joining CH2M Companies, he was an executive with Sandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He started his career and spent four years at the AT&T Bell Laboratories. In 2011, Dr. Iviso was appointed by the president for a five-year term on the National Science Board the governing board of the National Science Foundation and the National Science Policy Advisory Body to the President and the Congress. Dr. Iviso serves on a number of boards, panels, and advisory committees, including, and the list is very long, so we had to really shorten it a little bit, including the American Council on Renewable Energy Advisory Board, the Singapore Energy International Advisory board Panel, the Great Minds and STEM Board of Directors, the Colorado Renewable Energy Authority Board of Directors, the Stanford Precourt Institute for Energy Advisory Council, and he is a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration. Dr. Arvizo has a BS in Mechanical Engineering from New Mexico State University and an MS and PhD in Mechanical Engineering from Stanford University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dan Arvizo to our College of Engineering. <laughs> Thank you, Marwan, and, and uh, it's uh, just a true delight to be here uh, at the University of Central Florida, and, and certainly on, on such, a, such an important day, uh, I think, for the engineering college and, and the students who are uh, 
kind of coming to the culmination of some, of some projects in their senior year. I'm anxious to get a chance to, uh, to uh, see some of the projects, and I'll look forward to that. That's, a, that's a, uh, uh, an important um, and, in, uh, I think, uh, educational for me as well, a uh, stimulating opportunity to, to engage directly with kind of the, the, the students. One thing you'll, you'll hear in my presentation this morning is uh, how important innovation is. Uh, and so if you take away one uh, key uh, thought from, uh, from anything I say this morning, uh, it really is about that innovation is key to our future. It's key to, to um, uh, solving, I think, uh, the, the national and global problems that we will um, face uh, in the decades to come. And there's nothing more important than training that next generation of researcher, scientist, professional in the, in the energy sector uh, on, on the, uh, the ability to take innovation and convert it into societal benefits. So that's where I want to start. Um, again, uh, delighted to be here, and I really am uh, looking forward to, uh, to a very, very uh, exciting and stimulating day. I've got a lot of information in this uh, short time that I have with you that I'm, gonna, that I'm going to uh, fast forward through. It'll be like a movie almost. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to, 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 to alert you to is I'll put this presentation on our website, and so it'll be up, and uh, you can go to nrel.gov at uh, your leisure and, uh, and get access to all the charts that are here. So let me start with where I start with most of my talks, which is uh, the energy challenges that this country faces uh, really have three major dimensions, and unless we think about all of those simultaneously, we are going to essentially uh, under-optimize or, or not essentially achieve uh, the ultimate benefit that we want to get. And that re relates to national security, energy security, relates to competitiveness and economic prosperity, and uh, to environment. And all three of those are important. And the things you hear in the news uh, much, of the, much of the time uh, deal with one or the other. And in many cases, it's an either-or. And uh, as as those who are, who are going to be focused on the solving the problem, we need to be thinking holistically about the solution. So I just want to start with that the place I always start. Just a word about NREL. The National Renewable Energy Laboratory, it's a great place to work. I've got to tell you, it's one of the places where uh, I, I, get, I, I get stimulated all the time just walking down the hall talking to folks. Um, we're, about, we're, the, we're the Department of Energy's laboratory dedicated for renewable energy, energy efficiency, and I would say really energy transformation of our, of our energy system. Uh, we've, got, we've been around for more than three decades. We've got about 2,500 plus employees uh, on campus. Um, lots of really uh, neat and cool science that's going on there. Some, some very unique facilities. I'll talk about some of those. Um, and then uh, we're kind of trying to walk the talk. We're, you know, I, I, I purposed a number of years ago when I came into the lab, I said, you know, if we can't demonstrate on our campus what it is we're talking about, then we're really not very good stewards of, of the public trust in this area. So you'll hear more about me uh, on that. And then again, uh, we have a, I'm, a, I'm the president of an alliance that actually runs the laboratory. Uh, that's MRI Global, Battelle, uh, three Colorado uh, research institutions, Stanford and MIT. So those are the people that are on my board of directors. That's who I report to, and that's who I'm accountable to. OK, very, very quickly, we're noted for the renewable energy generation piece, which is that piece right there in the middle that says solar, wind, biomass, hydrogen, geothermal. Um, we also have the efficiency piece, which is the end use. That's the kind of how do you, how do you apply, apply this, uh, these technologies. And then everything in between that connects them. It's really a system, and you have to think about it in that context. Along the left-hand side, and I won't read this to you, but th these are some of the goals that the administration, and you heard these in the President's uh, State of the Union message and a variety of other. These are some of the goals that the nation has in terms of their, their uh, energy uh, transformation. And um, there's a lot of key things in there. And that kind of serves as our marching orders. That's kind of what we do and why we do it. Uh, on the right-hand side, and I won't, won't go through this either, but it's kind of what, what does NREL do? Well, the, what NREL does is we do the innovation. We do the basic science and research that goes on developing new pathways, new technologies. We do the integration. How do you put these onto the existing, existing, in the existing energy mix? Um, we do educating. So we have to have analysis and capabilities to understand what the real issues are. Um, we are, again try to model that behavior on our campus, and, and then we make sure and, and we facilitate the commercialization, getting these technologies into the marketplace, because that ultimately is a true measure of if we're being successful or not. Okay, so 
Uh, I'll start with a little bit big picture and then kind of narrow down. Big picture is that there is uh, a lot of evidence to support this notion that the energy system we have today, whether it's domestic or global, no longer really meets the societal needs that we need it to. So it's got to deal with, again, uh, it's, it's got to deal with competitiveness. So we want cheap energy prices. We want, we want cheap energy because ultimately that's the engine that fuels economic growth. But that's uh, a little bit uh, uh, con of concern today. We've got issues that relate to, to environment, both whether, you, wh you know, whether you're talking about long-term global warming kinds of issues with carbon loading in the, in the atmosphere or whether you're talking about environmental disasters and catastrophes that we all hear about in the news, uh, Gulf oil spill, the Fukushima nuclear reactor, uh, things that otherwise um, are, are risky to us in the future. Uh, those are all important things. And then, of course, what you hear about in the news today, if you just want to just get a ca caption of what's going on, is energy prices and particularly gasoline prices. Gasoline prices are really, really volatile. Down the right-hand corner, you see a map. That's a geopolitical map of who has the oil. Okay, if you, if you were to look at the, the Earth and, and, and look at all of the continents and look at the various uh, countries and say, it, by size, how, who, who has the most resource, this is what the map would look like. In terms, of, in terms of who has what, right? So obviously the Middle East has quite a bit. That's kind of where, where, where most, of the, most of the resource is. That hasn't changed, won't change anytime soon. So just recognize these are all port parts of what we ultim ultimately want to solve. Now, in terms of U.S. energy production, and there's a variety of things, you can go to the Energy Information Agency and get these kind of, these kind of numbers. Uh, the top chart is the, is the U.S. Uh, energy consumption. The bottom chart is the actual, I'm sorry, the top chart is production. The bottom chart is the consumption. The difference you'll see between these two charts is crude oil. We, 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 pr we produce about 15% of our energy from, you know, that relates to crude oil. We actually consume 36%. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means we import <laughs> the other stuff, right? Um, in, in terms of how much of that is so-called non-fossil fuel, it's a small part. It's a really small part. In fact, you'll see it. There are 7.6% non-hydro, 3% hydro. In terms of our, our, our production, that's roughly 10%. And again, a lion's share of that is, is hydro. So, uh, and, and that's the, 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 the produced part, the consumed part is, is actually less than that. So it, it's, it's a small part. And, uh, and, and the, the thing we fight in terms of renewable energy, energy efficiency is, so can this be more? And, and if so, how much more can it be? And uh, you know, for the first five years of my tenure at NREL, I was in front of Congress, I was in front of decision makers, I was in front of, 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 of investors, and they all asked me the same question, is how much can we have? Is, he, is, this, you know, what, is this all we're gonna get, 10, and, and, and do we do better in the future? Well, this, this chart, and again, I don't expect you to read it, but let me just tell you what it says. This chart comes out of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Special Report on Renewable Energy. It's a, it was a three-year effort. I was a coordinating lead author on that report, uh, an international effort. Every country in the world <laughs> brought their best scientists. I was the head of the solar chapter, so I actually uh, oversaw the writing of the solar chapter in this. It's a huge report, and it, you know, what, they, what they wanted us to say was, how much renewable energy can I have, how, at what cost, and by when? And the unfortunate piece is that we could do really none of those in terms of, in terms of being able to provide any kind of certainty. What we could say, though, and, and this is one of the charts that, that, that says it, is that a potential the potential, the technical potential, this is after you get rid of all the things that, that are unaccessible, the potential uh, opportunity from renewable energy globally is many-fold what the, what the global energy consumption is. And that, if you go to the far right-hand far, far right corner, and, and by the way, the numbers are on the bottom here, but if you look at that, our primary energy usage in the globe right now is 492 exajoules. That's kind of what the, the, the globe consumes in terms of energy uh, consumption. If you look at how much potential there is in just solar alone, it's many-fold that. So this is a log scale. And so what you see is that it, 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 it dwarfs what the, what the energy consumption of the globe is. So, and, and you can look at all of the technologies. Solar is the biggest one. But, the, but you look at all the, all the technologies, whether you're talking about electricity, heat, or, or primary energy, it is a huge amount. It's not a question of potential. It is not simply not a question of potential. We can have as much as we want, and that's essentially what I would tell congressmen and, and other people in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the legislature, is, is when they would ask me, how much can I have? And I said, well, how much do you want? It's not a matter of how much. That we're not limited by resources. I guess that's, that's the key point, and, it, and it's an important thing. This is a disturbing graph, and it's one that ExxonMobil puts out. I think it's pretty accurate. What it is is a reflection of where we're going to be in 20 years. If you look at the left-hand uh, uh, graphic, that's... That's North America. Our energy consumption 
and ex projected usage is pretty flat. If you look at Europe, which is the middle slide, that's, um, that's also pretty flat also. And in fact, both of these are very much going to be less carbon intensive than, than they are today, going forward in the next 20 years. That's, pretty good that's a pretty good news story. The disturbing thing is on the right-hand column. The right-hand column, that's the graphic of the developing nations. That's China, India, Indonesia. And what you see is a tremendous appetite for energy, and most of it is going to be coal. And what, you know, this is the projection going forward. And if you're, if you're worried about carbon loading and, 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 uh, and uh, essentially, you know, climate change kinds of issues, this should be disturbing. This is a huge issue. And the, and the real issue is not so much what are we going to do domestically. The issue is what are, what's the globe going to look like in terms of energy consumption? And so that's the problem we're solving. The problem we're solving is not one that relates so much to how we use energy domestically, but how we do things in a global context. That's the part that's missing from any conversation you'll hear about energy uh, in, the, in, the, in the public press. So the, the issue really has to do with how do we put ourselves in a position so that globally we're dealing with the problem that really we're going to face and that our, and many of you will face and our grandchildren will face. Um, and, it's, and it's a pretty daunting <coughs> issue. So here's, what, here's the solution. The solution is, is actually pretty straightforward. Along the left-hand side, you have a bunch of attributes of the present energy system. Along the right-hand side is, by anyone's measure, very desirable attributes to have in the future energy system. All right? And if we can just agree that that's what we're after, then I think the, uh, the agenda for how we develop and use energy would be very clear. Now, it, the, the, the unfortunate piece is we're still debating whether that's a good thing to have on the right-hand side. I think it's a pretty good thing to have. And the hard part is making a transition from where we are today to where we need to be. That's the, that's the issue. How can we get from today over, over to, to this other, other, other end state and do it in a time frame that isn't going to ultimately destroy you know, much of what we uh, now know as, as, as the way in which we, in, way, which we live? Well, it's really about innovation, and it's really about three things. It's the technology piece. We all kind of get that. And those of us that are scientists and engineers have been working on that piece for a long time, and that's pretty exciting, but you know, it's not the whole problem. The problem has to do with markets on the, on the lower right and also policies. Because we, in fact, have a system today that we purposed to have 100 years ago, and it has served us well. The problem with it is it doesn't serve us for the future. It's not sustainable. It's not the kind of, capability, or not the, not the kind of attributes that we want. So we have to do things in a very, very different way. And so as scientists and engineers and the, ne and the next workforce, what you need to be thinking about is not just the technology piece, but how does this all integrate into market solutions that the finance communities and the business communities all actually embrace and want to invest in? Because unless we make those choices, all these other people, all these other parts of the world and these other energy demand is going to follow the path that we took so far, which is not a sustainable path. And so we need to be in front of that, and there's all kinds of attendant benefits that go with that. It's challenging, and this is the good news and the bad news. The good news is, and I keep telling our staff at NREL, you know, don't have to worry about working yourself out of a job. Okay? <laughs> we're going to have a job for a long time. It, you know, don't worry about it. We're going to get done and wrap it up, and they're going to close the lab because we don't have anything to do. Not the case. This is really, really hard. And, the, and it really has to do with the fact that we haven't invested in R&D as, as a country. I think we're starting to now, but a very, very small fraction. Um, our, our, our system is incredibly inefficient. We have, in the electricity indus industry alone, the electricity uh, sector alone, we have about $2.5 trillion of investment, capital, equipment, investment. If you're talking about generating assets, transmission, distribution, that kind of stuff, $2.5 $2 trillion. The asset utilization of that sector is less than 50%, it's 47%, which means that, uh, if you think about it in business terms, $1.25 trillion of investment is sitting idle. Essentially what it says is our, our energy system, in other words, if, if you look at how much generating assets we have, it generates twice as much as the demand on an average basis. What that tells you is you have a really, really low asset utilization. There's not a sector in the, in the, in the economy that can survive with an asset utilization of less than 47%. What it says is we're really inefficient. That's the opportunity. We need to make that much more efficient, and it's, you've got a business case for it. Um, life, long life cycles. When you make an investment in a power plant today, it will last you, in many cases, 
50 years and in some cases 100 years. We're making investments today that last 100 years. Well, if you think about that, if you want to change the mix, we've got some real challenges because you're making investments today that will last 100 years. All right, the last thing is things are driven by national policy, and there's a lot to be said about that. Innovation, let me get into the, the technology piece. Innovation is really important. I think re really, so far, it's about reducing costs. And in my 30 years in, in the business, I have seen costs come down, in some cases a factor of 20, uh, in some cases a factor of 10, but there's tremendous progress being made. It's very exciting. Solar, biofuels, wind, I'll talk about a little bit of, the, of all of these. In the solar area, some, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm jazzed by the fact that we're finally seeing the things that I was working on in the lab, literally in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, it's now today's commercial product. And that's pretty exciting. We have four gigawatts of photovoltaics in terms of capacity, a half a gigawatt of, of, of concentrating solar power, four and a half, that's, pre that, that's pretty exciting, and we're moving fairly quickly. What's interesting to me is that this globally has taken off and we're getting left behind. You know, China will put in six gigawatts of solar in this calendar year alone. They will dwarf what we have done for the last 30 years in one year, all right? Germany has 18 gigawatts of solar energy in, uh, in play and in, in installed capacity. Germany's got the sunshine of Anchorage, Alaska, all right? If they can make it work in, in, in Germany, we can make it work in the U.S., believe me. And yet we're not moving as quickly and as we could or should. Germany's energy prices are much higher than ours. It gives them an advantage to some degree. You know, I'm not for raising energy prices, but we need to lower the cost. And so a lot of what we do has to do with that. And there are a number of capabilities and new, and new exciting things going on in the research lab. But what I can tell you about is when the things that, again, I saw in the laboratory, which were exciting 30 years ago and today's commercial product, it, if you walk through the lab today, incredible stuff going on. I mean, there is no, no uh, lack of innovation and new exciting ideas. What, our job is to make sure it doesn't take another 30 years to get those in the marketplace. All right, that's, that's what we're doing. Lots of process stuff. And so here's a couple of R&D 100 awards that we won over the last couple of years. Some really exciting things. Nanostructured materials is huge. That's a big deal. Everything, everything you hear about these days is nano something, nano bio you know, info. Well, nanostructured materials is a big deal, and it will be the, the future, I think, in terms of, in terms of uh, capabilities. Some of the exciting stuff that's going on, we've got, you know, we, we theorized 10 years ago that you could do some things, uh, for those of you that are device physicists, understand, which is, is to do multiple exciton generation, we call it. But what it is, is a photon comes into a, a, a semiconductor. You normally get one electron hole pair as, a, as an excited pair out of that via the bulk semiconductors. At the nanoscale, all those rules change. And when you do that, you can get multiple excitons, electron hole pairs, per photon coming in. All right? that's, a, that's an exciting area. We, we postulated that, that could occur. And in the last year, we've actually demonstrated that you can actually do that. And in fact, uh, some of the nanostructured materials and some of the uh, good uh, theory, theory that's going on at, at, at InRail, uh, I think is testament to that. And this is one of those things that will come out in science here uh, in the next month or so that will show, in fact, that that's the case. What that does, it opens up a whole new area of, of, of study and work and, and, and products that will eventually get us to a point where we can paint photovoltaics onto a surface, flexible surfaces and stuff that really is exciting. Uh, wind energy, when I started in the, in the energy business, uh, wind turbines, I could actually, uh, uh, the, the, the wingspan or the, the rotor diameter of a, of a turbine, I could actually put in, in my two arms like this, <clears throat> roughly a meter or so. Um, today, the, that is now over 100 meters, and in fact, um, the, the, these, these big machines, these five megawatt machines that you see, you can put an entire football field in the footprint of the rotor diameter. It is a huge, huge uh, um, mechanical marvel, I gotta tell you. These are huge, huge machines. Lots of great stuff going on. We've got 47,000 megawatts <clears throat> of, of installation in the country today. China just passed us. They have 60,000 megawatts. Of, of, of wind, wind energy, and a lot of, again, of, of activity there. It's, it's, the, it's the fastest growing because it is, in fact, the lowest cost technology that's out there. Uh, lots of great innovation, lots of really, really cool stuff that's going on, both in terms of reducing the weight, uh, compliant structures, uh, direct drives, uh, a whole bunch of things that really relate to, um, I think, what is, what is an interesting uh, whole engineering set of materials challenges. This, this graphic down here on the right-hand side is one of my favorites. It's, a, it's, a, it's an actual flow visualization uh, uh, photo because uh, the conditions were just right. This is in uh, Horns Rev uh, outside, of, uh, outside of the UK. 
where, where the, the fog is kind of showing the, the turbulence tails of the various wind turbines. And it's really interesting because one of the things is, as a, I'm a mechanical engineer and, 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 and computational fluid dynamics is one of my, one of my, one of my uh, uh, theme uh, topics, we did, we, we've never really done first principle calculations. And so what we've done is we've now been able to, to for, for that flow field, what we, what we determined here was the problem. The problem was we were, un, the, these wind farms are underperforming. We think they're going to provide a certain amount of energy, uh, and it turns out that they're 10 to 15 percent lower than that. We're trying to figure out why. It turns out it's, it's kind of related to this. So what we, uh, that, that photo, uh, what, what we did is we did a calculation. So, so using high performance computer, we did, uh, you know, a large edge simulation, three, three dimensional, um, three kilometers by three kilometers by, by uh, one kilometer, um, uh, um, essentially domain that we, that we chose. And then we did, we divided it up into 315 million cells. And then we did a, a, a full in, a full eddy uh, simulation calculation. It took us eight days on a, on a 400 teraflop machine to do a 10 minute simulation. But we were able to get this, get this flow field. And then we put the, tur the, the turbines into that uh, into that flow field and did the calculation of what it looks like from first principles in terms of turbulence and, 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 uh, and uh, energy production, turbine by turbine. What we found, and we actually have an, uh, an instrumented uh, wind, wind farm in, in Sweden that, that essentially is one that we simulated, uh, and this is the results of the, of, of the measurements and the results of the calculations, which demonstrates that we're really starting to understand the, the flow field dynamics and the loading on these various wind turbines, and the predictions are precisely what we're seeing in the field. So it, it, you know, for those of us that are the, both computational fluid dynamics the, and, and all of the flow field and the structural dynamics that go with that, it's a real world problem being solved now today by, 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 uh, by new technology that's, that I think uh, is, re is really exciting. Um, and it'll help us improve wind turbines in the future. Uh, biofuels, I, I won't say a lot about this other than it's, it is a hugely growing field. The, 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 the essentially taking all of the cellulosic materials and breaking down those molecules and re, reformulating in a way that they can not just be ethanol, but they can be uh, hydrocarbons that look a lot like um, gasoline molecules or, or, or regular uh, you know, uh, alkane uh, molecules uh, is, is a huge deal. And we're making make major progress in this area, both in the biochemical transport, thermochemical transport, uh, the, 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 big, uh, the big oil manufacturers and the refiners are all part of this because what we want to do is do drop-in fields. We want to take ethanol, non-food ethanol, uh, and I'm sorry, non-food biomass, cellulosic uh, um, uh, biomass, and putting it into these, the refineries and getting out of it uh, essentially hydrocarbon molecules that you can run jet airplanes on, that you can run ships and a variety of other things. It's, it's, a, it's a really exciting area, a lot of things that are going on. Energy um, innovation is, is really about integration because ultimately what we need to do is do this transformation that I was talking about. So everything that relates to whole buildings, making buildings more efficient, making cars and our transport sector more efficient, then generating what we have to generate with sustainable, renewable, low carbon energy is really the key. And so there is a lot of work going on, very exciting work going on at the laboratory uh, on, on, this, uh, on this area. And uh, you know, we, we're, again, trying to demonstrate what we, what we talk about. We've just moved into a new building. And our new building is shown up there on the, on the left hand of the high performance building. We've got 1,400 people in a, in a, in a building, 330,000 square foot building. And that building generates, on an annual basis, as much energy as it consumes, meaning that it is the world's most efficient building, first of all. And second of all, we're, we're essentially using solar as our generating source. And we generate energy uh, all year long. When the sun's out, we, we do that. We have 100% daylighting, which means that on any day when the sun is shining, you never turn the lights on inside the, inside the building. It's really, really quite remarkable in that sense. If you look at how much energy per person, it's 70 watts per person, on a, on a, on essentially on a continuous annual basis. 70 watts per person. If you think about what your laptop is, your laptop's 300 watts by itself. So we've given everybody a 24-watt LED monitor. We've given everybody 15-watt uh, thin client uh, you know, laptops. Uh, you know, you're not allowed, you're, it's contraband in our, in our building to have those little space heaters where you heat your, heat your, uh, your lo local workspace. We have centralized everything, and it really is a w different way of doing business. And if you think about your energy footprint, think about that in your workplace, and it really is revolutionary. And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, again, a demonstration of the fact that you can do these things today. And the first question everybody asks is, okay, that's great, how much extra did you pay? And the short answer is we didn't pay any extra. We paid less than a building built to code in the, in the Colorado area. 
And that, those principles can be transferred everywhere. This is, in fact, here and now and not rocket science. It really is something that you can do today. All right, lots of partnerships, lots of capabilities. I think we are connected to the marketplace because that's where the solution has to take place. So it's not just about the science. It's not just about the technology. It really is about moving that technology more rapidly. Um, we get a lot of visibility, and one of the things we get, we host over 20,000 visitors a year, uh, about 4,000 VIP visitors. Uh, a few of these you'll recognize on this chart. Just in the last year, uh, the, the, the person on the left hand up at the top is the president of Honduras. The person on the right hand side is the, is the vice president of the United States. That's Joe Biden. Uh, Under secretaries of energy and, and science, uh, Ban Ki-moon, the secretary general of the UN, is uh, right here in this, in this uh, chart. Uh, many of the cabinet level officials have come through, uh, energy ministers from all across the country, the Armed Services Committee of, 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 of the, of, for Defense uh, in, in, from the Congress, uh, a number of our partners from, from around the world, lots of visibility. This is an exciting area, I got to tell you. I am, I am one of the most privileged people uh, on, the, on the planet to be able to get a chance to, to lead such an organization because it is our national trust. This is where the nation invests in the future of our energy system. It's an important and I think an, an interesting opportunity. Uh, just to say a, a little plug for our, uh, for, our, for our programs, we have undergraduate programs. So through the Department of Energy, and again, you can see the website here, and you can get it when you download the, the, the thing. What it allows you is opportunity to obviously uh, uh, come to the laboratory. We have about 50 interns on, on, a, on, an annual, on a summer uh, basis that are part of the undergraduate program. We have uh, a, a smaller number of graduate students that come as, as part of our graduate program. Uh, we have a, you know, a research participant program. There's several hundred of those. So on any given you know, summer day, we'll have uh, three or 400 um, non, uh, you know, student intern, student kind of participants. Uh, and, and there's a lot of opportunities, I think, that go with that. So I encourage you to take a look at that. There's, uh, there's, there's, great, there's, there's great experiences that one can gain uh, from that. Um, this is our vision. It's really about sustainability. It's really about contributing to national economic prosperity. Uh, I, I think um, it's, it's an exciting field to be in, and it's a growing field, and we need lots of professionals. We need a lot of folks that really do that. I'll just say a word to the students. I, I think it's important to me that, that, uh, that uh, we have more students pursuing careers in, in STEM in general, but, but specifically in energy. I think it's a growing area, an exciting area going forward. You know, if you start thinking about what your profession, what your career is going to look like, it really has four dimensions. This is, comes from Stephen Covey stuff. It's an economic one, which is kind of, how am I going to get paid? I'm going to make, make some money. The other is a kind of a, a social thing, which many of us are, are very much interested in working in teams, working together, working with other people. Uh, another is a psychological thing, which really relates to uh, learning, lifelong learning. We're all learning all the time. Things are changing. You need to keep, keep up that, that motivation. And then there's kind of a spiritual piece, which it says, it's the part that says, I want to make the world a better place. I want to do something that's, that's exciting, that makes me feel good about, about my contributions. The little, the little uh, mnemonic device that I use, it's live, love, learn, and leave a legacy. Those are the things that really should be important to anyone who's embarking on a career, certainly careers in STEM and, and, and science. And I would offer that you need to decide, you know, which, what's the balance of those? That's really the decision that you have to make. There's great opportunity. You know, I am rewarded by what I get to do because my personal passions have to do with energy, science, and education. And I get to do all of those in the context of my job. So I've got the NREL thing. I get to do the energy piece. That's great. Uh, I work on the National Science Board, which is a science-focused uh, effort for the country, uh, something that I'm, that I'm particularly uh, uh, excited by. And then there's the, there's, the, there's, the, there's the component of Great Minds in STEM, which is I'm on the board of directors for this, for this not-for-profit that's about increasing the, the participation of, of, of scientists and engineers in the, in the marketplace, and specifically those that are in the underserved communities. And, and that one I'm, I'm particularly excited about. It, we actually have a conference every, every year, and, and the last uh, couple of years we've had it here in, in Orlando, and, and, next, and this year we'll have it in Orlando as well. And so I encourage you as part of, uh, part of a, the local community to, 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 to seek that out. Uh, go, go to greatmindsinstem.org, and I think uh, it'll, it'll offer you a lot of, a lot of uh, specifics. And it really is an area where I think uh, you can see other professionals and get some, see some role models, engage with industry. They've got a career fair. It's kind of an exciting thing. It happens in, in, in October, and, uh, and, and uh, there's an award ceremony that goes with that. I encourage you to look that up. Uh, so finally, I'll, just, I'll, I'll end with this. Um, for, for, for you students, find something that interests you. I get up every morning, and I'm excited about going to work. It, it just... You know, don't tell my bosses, but I would work for free. I mean, it really is something that's important. I, and I, I think, and I, and I get energized by the opportunity. Uh, you know, you'd ha you do have to worry, work on, on work-life balance. Some of us tend to be type A personalities, and we go all into everything. 
uh, there's an opportunity to have a, a, a meaningful work-life balance. Uh, get from your mentors and your other people around uh, uh, all that you can absorb, because there's the, the world is a is a is a is a you know an open canvas for for, for many of you, uh, and I think it's it's a, it's an exciting place. Be committed. There's no no substitute for hard work, and and also really being dedicated. Uh, take some risks. You know that's the part that I yeah, I've changed jobs every every few years, um, and it's exciting to do something different to expand the horizons. It opens up new opportunities. And then ultimately, when you do get a chance to, 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 uh, to have some success in the field, uh, give back to those, the next generation. I think those are things that, uh, for me, uh, I think are re most rewarding. Um, so, so come visit us at the, at the, at, at the website, nrel.gov. Uh, there's a lot of this information. This presentation will be on there. I wish you well. I wish those of you that have got projects, uh, I, I'm, I'm confident that they, that they came out well. But uh, I, I do encourage you that you use this experience as a learning opportunity for the future. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for just a <laughs> wonderful and stimulating talk. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have a couple of minutes for, for some questions, sure. if there are any questions. Uh, How do you deal with uh, setbacks in your uh, job when you really believe in something and it does go your own way? And, uh, yeah, that's a good question for those that didn't hear it. How do you deal with setbacks? How do you deal with uh, you know, having tried something and, and it, uh, it perhaps didn't work out the way you expected it to? Uh, you know, I, I'm trained as an experimentalist, and, and one of the things that I learned about, exper about doing experiments is that you kind of have to do it once to figure out how to do it. So it's, it's almost as though you have to learn from that, from that trial and error. Uh, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a book, I think it's called uh, um, um, Pasture's Quadrant, uh, that's, very, that's very illustrative in this arena. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to approach, uh, to approach science, and, and one of those is the Edisonian approach, which, which is you try lots and lots of things and you learn from those. And when you talk to Thomas Edison, you ask him, well, you know, so you tried all these things and you only, you know, it took you 10,000 tries to find the light bulb. He, you know, he essentially said, well, every one of those was a learning experience and it took me, you know, all those others uh, to, to find the one that really did work. So, so there's, there's, a certain, um, there's a certain part of, of lifelong learning. Taking risks is about being willing to fail. And I think uh, I, I don't get discouraged by that. We try to encourage our, I want some successes, by the way. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I think of it in terms of a portfolio. And, and, and if in the portfolio, what you do is judge the portfolio, not the individual you know, stocks and bonds within the portfolio. It's, it's the overall performance of the portfolio. I think we're well served to have some high risk kinds of things always in the pipeline. Uh, some of them pay off. Many of them don't. In fact, most of them don't. So I, I look at you know, kind of both success in terms of of, of, of career paths as well as the, um, the, the technology pieces uh, as in, that, in that portfolio sort of concept. So I don't get discouraged too much. It's, it's, it's just it makes you roll up your sleeves and try harder. So um, that's kind of how we handle it. You talked a lot about kind of the global uh, aspects of energy and how that's not really well known here in this right. country or even part of the discussion. And so in, in sort of a, a broader context, what do you think is the proper role of the United States and what we're trying to do in energy in a broader context? Since you know so much of the demand is going to be elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the, the 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 short answer to that very astute question is is uh, we need public awareness to help. I think us develop a leadership mentality. We used to have the leadership. All these technologies that are now part of the global environment, certainly the new ones. Uh, were all developed here. They were all developed in the, in the 70s, 80s, and in some cases the 90s. And, and they've all gone offshore, others exploiting the benefit of our innovation. Uh, I, I think it, it is, we, we've become very insular. We, we've become very focused on things that happen domestically, very short-term, horizon-oriented. And as a nation, I, I think we need to be thinking more expansively, more broadly. It's collaborative, it not, not so much in, insular. And as a consequence, uh, and, and, and right now we're kind of in some sort of crazy, silly season where we've got this great polarization, which I think will eventually wash out. I, I think if you talk to you know, uh, members of, of Congress who are more moderate in, in, in their views and willing to reach across the aisle and work with each other, I think national policies actually uh, can be born out of, out, of, out of that kind of discussion. Uh, we do th need to think globally about energy is a commodity. Energy is not a domestic, you know, unique thing. As a consequence, we, we need to be thinking, uh, we'd be having a much more sophisticated conversation about our energy policy. We don't have one of those de facto. It's grassroots. It's, 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 it bottoms up. 
um, that's kind of the way we are. You know, the, the, I think it was Churchill, or the, the Europeans like to say about the Americans, you know, um, they'll, they, they, are, they can be counted on to eventually do the right thing after they've exhausted all the other possibilities, right? And, and, I, and I think we're kind of in that mode. I hope it's not too late to catch up. Um, innovation is moving incredibly quickly. Uh, again, I was in China last week. I'm going to Europe next week. Uh, what I see is, is incredible attention by other governments to invest, to focus on innovation. Um, we don't have an exclusive right to innovation. I think right now we have the leadership, and, 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 and if that's important. We need to grab the benefit of that, and we need to encourage most of the, more of the others. So that's my soapbox in terms of what I think the country needs to do. And right now we're not having the right kind of conversations about, about innovation, investment and energy and we need to have that and hopefully um, maybe after November we get into a different mode and that'll that'll improve. Yeah over here I think is the question. That's the central issue of the debate that's out there. Let me just offer a couple of personal observations. So I, I'm, I'm a big student of, of, of principle-centered leadership and the things that, 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 that Stephen Covey talks about. One of the, one of the key issues of the seven habits uh, that I think uh, is missing here is, is we really need to be thinking that it's easy to say no to something if there's a greater yes. And we haven't found the greater yes. And so where we have an incumbent technology, if you will, incumbent industry business model, uh, they're going to hold on tenaciously to that. I mean, they've got, I mean, if you've got 97% of the market, why do you want to change anything, right? I mean, I've heard that from battery manufacturers literally two decades ago. Uh, th the issue has to do with it's about economics. It really is about economics. It's about, it's a, it's about you know, uh, enlightened self-interest. Um, I don't think we're going to save the planet by having altruistic um, uh, goals that don't translate to personal benefit. We, we do need to be thinking about the business model for what does it take to change the minds of the incumbents. I think the incumbents, whether they're investor-owned utilities or whether they're uh, big oil companies or whatnot, you know, we, we tend to vilify them as being essentially you know, evil in some way. A actually, they're doing what's in their self-interest. I mean, they're, they're about making money and it's about shareholder value and I get that. And if I'm the CEO of one of those or I'm the board of the CEO, I'm, I said, that's what, you, that's what I want you to do. That's not the problem. The problem is the, is the rules. The rules that we've set in our energy system are the ones that are on the left-hand side of my chart, not on the right-hand side. And until we change those rules, the incumbents are going to do what they've always done, which is to essentially maximize shareholder value. What we need to be thinking through is how do we change those rules in a way that they can be part of the solution, not part of the problem? That, that conversation we've not had. And as a consequence, I think what we end up with is this very minuscule, incremental type of progress. So on the one hand, I want the technology to be the killer app. I want it to be so cost effective that it is the choice that everybody will make. But we've subsidized our present system to the point where it's really hard for them to compete. Now, we can put all the onus on the technology and say, all right, you just got to be cheaper than natural gas at the lowest price that it can be. That's a hard thing to do, and that's going to take a while. Okay. Will we get there? Yeah, we'll get there. It's going to take a while. That's the issue. So we've got some sort of transition strategy that we need. That's the nature of a public policy. Not that you're going to subsidize forever. That's never anybody's, in anybody's interest. It is about making that transition, changing the rules to get to that other point. And I, you know, I'm bullish on the technology. The technology will get there. If you don't care how long it'll take, it'll get there. But if you care how long it'll take, and for the reason that I talked about, we're making 100-year decisions. We're making 100-year decisions today. You put in coal plants in China, you're making a 50-year decision. That's a lot of lock-in. That's a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. That's a lot of things that we don't want in the future. And as a consequence, that's going to come back and bite us. So our public policy has to deal more with long-term horizons, has to deal with what I call preventive medicine. We're really good at crisis management. We're not good at preventive medicine. We're not good at the time value of money. We're not good at the long-term benefit from a near-term investment. 
And that's the, that's the dilemma we have to get over in terms of public policy. So I get the point. I understand it. I've been in this business a long time. We're not going to make radical changes without new radical thinking. One of the things I like to say is we need to invent the future that we want. We can get there. There's no question. You want 50% renewables, you want 100%. You can get there. It will take you some time and it will take some investment. How you get there is another question. And that's what the Europeans are doing and what the Asians are doing. They've got more aggressive targets in China that we didn't have in this country. That should be an, a warning bell, an alert of some sort to us. And we, again, not having the conversation we need to have. So it really is about educating our, I mean, our elected officials are a reflection of us. They, they are what we think. So if we don't like that, we ought to change that. That's really what we ought to be about. And we in the professional community, in the, in the, in the technical community, need to, be, need to be part of that conversation. In the days of the scientists and engineers sitting back in the corner and being asked to do, you know, go find a solution for something are over. We need to be part of that dialogue. And part of what I think the new professional will have is that broader understanding. So when you're in your cocktail party and you're talking to your friends and your, and your family, you're giving them straight scoop and not this soundbite misinformation that you hear in the news and on commercials. That's not where the real situation lies. And as a consequence, I think uh, we've got some work to do on education and awareness. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question, and, and, and thank you for asking it because I think it, it one missing piece that I haven't talked about just yet, and that is the, the ecosystem. There, there is in fact an e ecosystem. I, I think uh, small business, by by many measures, uh, is the is the engine that drives the economy, and and that's really where where the action is. You know, large large corporations or whatnot, they tend around and, and they, they they do you know they do investments whenever they see things that are springing up. Uh, I think you know. I don't know, I just, I just, didn't Facebook just buy a, 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 a yeah, it's, yeah, that, that, yeah, there's a heat, you know, so somebody can make a lot of money real quick. Uh, the entrepreneurial spirit is what drives our, uh, I think, our, our entire economic, economic development ecosystem. And so I think the, the role for the small entrepreneur uh, should be better, should be bigger, should, should in fact in the future, I think, drive ultimately the outcomes that we're looking for. And, and, and the way you have to, you have to develop the, the environment in which those things can flourish. And that really also relates to public policy in, in a lot of things. We need to encourage that. We need to have more university participation, more research parks, uh, more attention to the fact that that is a, 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 a one of the strengths of this country that is not held elsewhere. Uh, nowhere in the world do we have the kind of entrepreneurial spirit that you have in this country if we cultivate it, if we, if we encourage it. And so I think to, to a large degree, uh, that is where most of the new, the, the new things will happen. The rules of the marketplace have to change so that there's less risk in, in making those kinds of, um, you know, for, for people to get into those kinds of businesses. Um, and, and I think that, again, if the rules are right and, and, the, and the market's healthy, uh, that's a huge piece of the equation. And ultimately, you'll see the shakeout and all these kind of things. As you get closer and closer to what I would call the competitive you know, threshold, where things can take off on their own without a lot of federal uh, intervention, um, I, I think you'll see a lot more opportunity in, in that space. Right now, it's kind of hard. If you want to be an entrepreneur in some of these uh, more alternative technologies, whether it be batteries or whether it be vehicle to grid or, or anything that really relates to, to generation and distributed resources, um, it's, a hard, it's a hard slog. That, those are hard things to do. You have to have angel investors. You have to have patient capital. You need people who are willing to take a chance and be patient long, long term. As, as you get closer and closer to that competitive threshold, that will open up and there will be a proliferation. Things will change. It, it'll be internet-like stuff. It'll be in, information-driven-like stuff. Right now, if you're an incumbent with a lot of asset and a lot of asset capitalization, you're hard to compete with. You just simply can't overcome those barriers. It's all highly regulated, lots of things. We need to open up that entire marketplace so it's something quite different than what we see today in the energy sector. It needs to look like these other sectors. And where I get the difference between you know, energy and IT, I mean, I understand those differences, 
the business model needs to be the same. And I think with the smart grid and the opportunity for information sharing and kind of and kind of how those technologies grow and, and, and evolve and become you know competitive in the marketplace, you know, then we'll get those big acquisitions like we're seeing in the in the information sector, uh, in the energy sector. And then then and only then will we know that we've arrived. You know, at that point, uh, then then things things can change. I, I see a vision for that. I don't know how long it'll take. It may take decades. Um, but I see that as an opportunity in the future. Uh, in the meantime, we've got to keep, kind of keep moving along the path that we're on and make as much progress as we can. Thank you again for listening. Thank you. Thank you.